Reading today is from Luke 22, verses 14 to 20. May we open our hearts to the reading of these words. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. May we be granted wisdom and courage for interpretation. Amen. Please rise. Oh, I'm sorry. Good morning, church. My name is Megan Hatcher. For those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, uh, my husband and I have been members here since about 2022. Uh, and today is the next installment in our stewardship series, which has been wonderfully and longly named. Um, I'm looking at you all, yes. From bread and wine to faith and giving. Uh, a note about today's sermon. Typically, a pastor does not tell too many stories about oneself in the preaching moment, right? Because the pastor is not the point of the sermon. Today, I'm taking a bit of personal um, privilege, I suppose, and I'm going to tell a couple of personal stories because I think giving and stewardship and generosity is nothing if not personal. So the very fact that I am standing here today in this pulpit in front of you wearing a stole and preaching is nothing short of a miracle. See, that's because back in 2015, Corey, my husband and I, were attending an evangelical church where we were actively involved and we were serving, uh, we had served for years in the youth ministry. And I was in grad school at that time, and I started to feel some rumblings of a call for myself to go to seminary and to become a pastor. Now, in this church setting, when I shared excitedly what I felt like God was, was saying to me, what I felt like the Holy Spirit was calling me to in my life, I shared that with church leaders and was met with concern. I was told, uh, there was one sentence that I will forever remember, which was that for me, as a woman, to pursue church leadership was sin with a capital S. Now that sentence from someone that I trusted and admired and had cultivated a long, you know, years-long relationship with, someone who had been in Corey's and my wedding, was devastating. And it sent me into a tailspin of depression and discernment that lasted for months. Now, spoiler alert, uh, we obviously went to seminary, and I did that very thing that was considered sin. But that story impacted Corey and me. Corey was actually taken out uh, for breakfast by some of those church leaders, and it be quickly became obvious that it was an intervention. And he was being asked if he was going to, quote, let his wife go to seminary. <laughs> I wasn't expecting all the gasps. This is fun. Um, and obviously, there is no let in Corey's in my relationship and go to seminary we did. So now months into my own process of discernment and after being kicked out of that evangelical church, I met a woman pastor who I believe God put in my life at the perfect time. And she became an incredible mentor to me and an incredible source of encouragement. And I remember distinctly having a conversation with Trista when she asked me and she said to me 
that if you think you can be anything but a pastor, you probably should be. And what she meant by that is that this calling, the call to being a pastor, is incredibly difficult work at times. But that response, you know, that question from her and my response was very clear, that I am a pastor. So fast forward, and Corey's and my journey took us to Washington, D.C. for three years of seminary that changed me as a student and then changed Corey because our dinner conversations were all about theology for the three years that we were there. And since then, I've served as Pastor Megan in churches in Missouri, Washington, D.C., Virginia, and Texas. And I have always felt that the church, capital C, ecclesia, the Greek word that means the gathered body, I have always felt that that is where I am called to give of myself, even when some of the loudest people in the church have not loved me back. Now, I know, church, that my story of not being affirmed for who I am is unfortunately not unique. I'd imagine that every single one of us in this room has either experienced our own source of church hurt or we love someone who has. And that's because wounding is something that I believe too many churches are far too good at. And so that's why me standing here in this pulpit today is nothing short of a miracle. Because this is one of those miraculous churches that chooses to love first, period. In our culture, with all of its division, its hate, its harsh rhetoric and violence and greed, there is literally nowhere else that proclaims that you are first and foremost a beloved child of God. Nowhere else. Not on social media, not at your job, maybe not even in some of your relationships, and certainly not in our political discourse. Think of all of the noise and the messages that you hear throughout any day or week. Where else are you reminded that you are precious? When I served in that youth ministry in that evangelical church, there was a sentence that for whatever reason became extremely important to me that I said to my small group kids as often as I could. And so I would tell kids every chance that I got that there is literally nothing that you could do that would make God love you more, and there is nothing that you could do that would make God love you less. Do you believe that? Sometimes all the distractions that swirl around us in our daily lives make it extremely hard to remember that one pivotal truth. Which is why one of the most compelling reasons for showing up here on Sunday mornings for fighting with your kids to get them dressed and in the minivan and here at 10 a.m., for fighting with your partner to say, oh, do we really want to go this week? Perhaps one of the most compelling reasons is to remind you of who you actually are. And it's to remind others who they actually are, just like we did when we just passed the peace, just like we do when we come to that table. I believe that we are hardwired as humans to crave the affirmation that only God can provide. But instead, we are so tempted to accept the junk food of instant gratification from social media posts or promotions or raises at work or the pleasure that we think buying just one more object will give us. And friends, Jesus knew that temptation too. So on the night before he died, he did something miraculous. He had dinner with his friends. I'm going to reread our scripture for us. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, 
which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. There's so much in this passage, but I want to draw our attention to just two phrases. In verse 15, Jesus says, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus knew that on the night before the hardest day of his life, he needed to be with friends. He needed to sit around the table with people who could look him in the eye and remind him of who he really is, God's beloved child. Because when we remind one another who we really are, especially in the hardest times of our lives when the days feel dark, we are strengthened for whatever it is that life throws at us. And this brings me to another story. In March of this year, I got a phone call from my mom telling my sister and I that she has stage 4B cancer. Now, I'm a person who processes hard things by moving my body. I am a runner and a swimmer, and that is where I do my best thinking. So after I had gotten that phone call, I laced up my shoes and I went, out, went on a walk. And as I walked and I thought and I prayed, I kept thinking one phrase that just continually was flooding my mind. You're holding us. You're holding us. You're holding us. And the you in that sentence was clearly God, because I believed then and I still believe now as we have weathered through this journey that God is and has always been holding us. So when we found out even more bad news, as my mom has gone through grueling treatments and surgery, and as my sister and I have stepped into the role of caregivers, God has held us. But church, you have held me too. Every week when I'm in town and not with my mom, you ask me how my mom is doing. You offer your encouragement and you tell me that you will pray for her and for me and for our family. And that has been an essential source of strength for me these many six months. It feels like we have lived two lifetimes in the last six months, and you have been there along for all of it. None of us is meant to go through life alone, which is yet another reason to participate actively in the work and the mission of this church. Communities like this one are a means of grace, to quote my Wesleyan theology, in our lives if we will allow it. We all need to be reminded by people who help us to carry life's burdens of what resides at our core, the love that holds us together and bring, brings breath to our lungs. Just like Jesus, on the night before the hardest day of his life, we need to be reminded who we really are, God's beloved children. In verse 19 of our passage for today, there's another phrase that I want us to notice. Jesus continues the meal with his friends, and our scripture says this, Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his friends, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Anglican priest Tish Harrison Warren writes that, quote, at the Last Supper, Jesus tells his disciples to eat in remembrance of him. Of all the things that Jesus could have chosen to be done in remembrance of him, Jesus chose a meal. He could have asked his followers to do something impressive or mystical, climb a mountain, fast for 40 days, or have a trippy sweat lodge ceremony. I'm glad he didn't ask for that. But instead, he picks the most ordinary of acts, eating through which to be present to his people. Jesus chose to remind himself and his friends at the Last Supper that the ordinary, often overlooked things of this world, like bread and wine, can be miraculous. So every time we gather at that table for the Eucharist, as we will in just a few moments, or at the cluttered, busy tables in our own homes, we are reminded that God is as near to us as the food that we eat, and God is as essential for our survival. But this meal is also a call into a new way of being in the world, 
an orientation away from individualistic junk food that our culture tells us will sustain and satisfy. Tish Warren, Warren goes on to say, the Eucharist is a profoundly communal meal that reorients us from being people who are merely individualistic consumers into people who are together capable of imaging Christ in the world. The Eucharist reminds us that even amidst the me-oriented culture that we live in, we actually can choose to look outside of ourselves and sacrifice some of our own self-interest for the good of the community. So during this season of generosity at our church, that's the invitation in front of all of us. Corey and I give financially to this church because our lives have been changed here. And we believe that there are still countless people in our city who need to be reminded of their belovedness as they find their place at Christ's table. This season of giving, of financial pledging, it isn't about guilt or shame. It's definitely not about obligation. It's about celebrating and committing to be a partner in this work that God has given to us to create something precious something miraculous together. So will you join me in celebrating the often overlooked miracles that unfold every day here at this church as we seek justice, love without boundaries, and model Christ in our community and in our world? My invitation to you this season is that you'll give sacrific sacrificially so that this church and the witness that it provides can continue to grow in our community. Thanks be to God. Amen.